Good afternoon, guys. So I'm Scott Sparks. I'm uh, one of the staff in the Department of Urology at Children's. Um, recently, in response to our increased volume of stone disease that, that Shamir and I have been seeing, we've sort of started a, um, a stone center at Children's, and hopefully that will become more robust as things go on. But we've been seeing so many more stones, we wanted to sort of talk with you guys about um, commonly seen things, how they're diagnosed, and, and long-term management, et cetera. So I'm going to tackle the acute stone management, sort of the urology aspect of, of kidney stone disease. Today I'm going to talk quickly about presentation and diagnosis and then various types of management, both conservative and surgical management. So in terms of presentation, everyone knows renal colic is the main thing that we see. Renal colic is characterized by intense flank pain, which, is, which has a sudden onset, and these kids can't get comfortable. That's one of the real hallmarks that we see. Just ask them, can they move into a position that's comfortable? If they can, it probably isn't stone disease. This is really severe pain that these kids have. And just to demonstrate, obviously everyone knows where, where the flanks are, but again, they just can't get comfortable. Plus or minus nausea, vomiting, although many of them will, um, and plus or minus hematuria. More frequently, we'll see microscopic hematuria, but every once in a while, you do see gross hematuria in these kids presenting with stone disease in the ER or at your office. Um, and they may or may not have lower urinary tract symptoms. It really depends on the location of the stone in the urinary tract. The more distal um, the stone, the more frequently they're gonna present with like dysuria, um, urinary frequency, urgency, et cetera. Um, physical exam is obviously very important, but it's also important to remember that it can be fairly nonspecific. Um, remember that there are a lot of things that can present with abdominal pain, and it may not be just um, confined to the flank. It may be diffuse. So you have to still think about things like appendicitis, gallbladder disease, even ovarian pathology, as well as other um, GI sorts of things. Um, in terms of lab work, obviously everyone who presents with um, with what we think might be stone disease, we want to at least get a urinalysis on them. Um, do they have hematuria? Almost all of them are going to have microscopic hematuria. If they do not have microscopic hematuria, you might want to put something else at the top of your differential. Obviously, that's not a hard and fast rule, but that's most of the time. Um, you may or may not want to get a CM CBC or a basic metabolic panel. It really depends on what the kid looks like. Obviously, if they look toxic, you're gonna to get those things. If they look like they're pretty good, we oftentimes don't. You just kinda of have to play it by ear and see how the kids look. In terms of imaging, um, in the world of stones, CT scans are the gold standard. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in kids because they are definitely not used as often in kids. But they're great. They give us really great detailed anatomic information and they can pretty much see all stone sizes and types. I give a little asterisk, there are a few stone types that are not visible on, on CT scan, but they're very, very rare and even rarer in the pediatric population. So here's just a, an example of what a CT scan and a stone would look like on that scan. Ultrasounds are what we use the most often in pediatrics. Obviously there's no radiation involved. They can be extremely reliable, but you have to have a reliable tech who's used to doing these and who's used to looking for stones, and you have to, when you're looking at it, you have to know what you're looking for. But if you do, they can be just as reliable, if not more so, than CT scans in, mo in most patients. <clears throat> here you can see an image of a, of a, of a kidney here um, with a stone in the lower pole. This is actually the exact same patient um, that I showed you before. They just happen to have a CT scan and an ultrasound. Um, and then we also sometimes use KUBs. Um, I typically don't use them as much for diagnosis. Um, I use them more for planning treatment, deciding if I'm going to, how I'm going to approach it surgically, what modality I'm going to use, et cetera. This is a different patient, but it happens to be in the same location. So um, I'll show you those three images together here in just a moment. So to talk about why we don't necessarily use CT scans as often in, ch <clears throat> in children, I don't know if you, any of you guys saw the article in um, the Washington Post on Monday actually looking at this issue. This is something that's gaining a lot of traction in the press. This is something that, that people are, are hearing about. I get asked about this all the time by patients, parents um, who have had CT scans. Um, it's really quite impressive the difference um, in, a, in radiation that these kids get when you're looking at KUBs versus CT scans, et cetera. And um, these numbers are actually for the general population, so adults really. Um, 
And when you look at kids, pediatric doses are actually much higher. They don't have as much fat to shield them. They don't have as much other soft tissue to shield their organs. So they're actually getting a much higher dosage of radiation for the same test. Then when you also think a lot of these kids are getting multiple passes through the CT scanner, they may be getting with and without contrast, with and without contrast and with, the de with delayed images. So they could be getting more than three times this amount of radiation. So it is very significant. There have been lots of papers that talk about radiation risk um, and malignancies. This was also touched on in the, in the Washington Post article on Monday. Uh, but this is, is one from a few years back. This was a, a great article. The same, the same authors actually published something in the New England Journal of Medicine shortly thereafter, looking at radiation risk in these in patients in general who have had CT scans. But if you look, I mean, kids who have had CT scans are exponentially more likely to present with a cancer at some point in their lifetime than adults who have had CT scans. Um, and it's the same for head versus abdominal CT scans. Um, it's just something we really like to avoid in children if we can at all, all avoid it. Um, so we try to avoid that, but there are drawbacks of ultrasound. So sometimes we do still get CT scans on these kids. You have to have an experienced tech, someone who knows what they're looking for and knows how to get you the images where you can see the stone. If the stones are really small, they're hard to see. There is a, a threshold for visualization. Um, you can typically see pretty well stones that are about three millimeters and above on ultrasound. Below that, they get a little bit tricky, um, but you can see them smaller. Um, if the stones are softer, they can be much more difficult to identify. You're not gonna see much shadowing behind them, um, and they're just not gonna look as hard. Um, and if the location is outside the kidney, like in the ureter, um, really an ultrasound can't visualize the ureter very well, except down at the UVJ. So you are gonna miss some stones that way. Um, I just wanted to put these three images up um, just to demonstrate um, how different they look. Um, and you can see that by far the CT scan gives you the clearest picture. You can really identify that stone very easily. It looks just like bone. Um, but on this one, I mean, this is a great image. We can see the stone beautifully. You can see that there's a nice acoustic shadow behind the, behind the, the stone. So in this case, this, the CT scan was really unnecessary. And again, this is, a, this is a large stone, so it's very easy to see on KUB, but oftentimes they're not that easy. Especially kids we see often have a lot of stool in their colon, so it can be very difficult to see a stone on a KUB in a kid. So moving on to management, uh, talking about conservative management first. Conservative management is always our first choice. We would always prefer that these kids pass their stones on their own. Um, there's much less risk of damage to the urinary tract. And if you can do it, most of the time, the, the families are very grateful. Um, the problem is you have to be patient um, and you have to have a family that's motivated to pass the stone this way. Uh, but not everyone's a candidate. Um, in order to be a candidate, you have to be able to get the kid's pain controlled. Um, obviously, if the kid is in terrible pain and requires narcotics IV, they are not a good candidate for, for conservative management. But if you can get their pain under control with PO pain medication, um, that's a good patient. Um, if they, have a, they need to have a normal white blood count, so we don't want someone who looks toxic, has a super elevated white blood count, um, and they need to have a normal creatinine. Um, we do manage patients conservatively even if they have complete obstruction of a unilateral kidney. As long as they've got two kidneys, that's fine. You can have relatively complete obstruction for a short period of time and still do f fine. Of course, we are gonna watch those patients very closely and we're not gonna give them a long course of conservative management, but we, we do, those patients can be candidates. Um, you have to ask yourself, should I manage this patient inpatient or outpatient? Sometimes it's best to bring them in, give them IV fluids, control their pain before you're going to send them out. Um, and we do that sometimes. If you're managing them conservatively, you want to really stress to them how important fluids are. They need to be drinking. Drink, 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 drink. We want to flush the kidney stone out. It's not going to come out on its own if they're not drinking anything. Um, and in terms of pain medication, um, obviously narcotics, I think, are probably the most commonly used, but we do use short courses of NSAIDs for these patients. As, again, as long as they have a normal creatinine, um, NSAIDs can be great. I mean, you can decrease the inflammation in the ureter and, and allow that stone to pass a little bit more uh, readily. We'll also frequently use antiemetics in these patients. Um, some patients will have nausea with no pain, and so they may just need some, some, some PO Zofran or something to get them through the, the time while they're trying to pass the stone. 
And lastly, we do use alpha agonists in children. Uh, the most commonly used one is Flomax or Tamsulosin. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with it. It's fairly new to the pediatric world. It's primarily a medication that's made for, for men with big prostates who have trouble peeing. Uh, basically, it works on alpha receptors on the smooth muscle and it relaxes the, the smooth muscle in the prostate. But those same receptors are present in other parts of the urinary tract and in a relatively significant concentration in the distal part of the ureter. So if you have a stone in the distal ureter, we will often put these kids on, a, on, a, on Flomax to try to help relax that distal ureter to allow the stone to pass through. And I've had a lot of success with it. A lot of people have. There are some, some trials that have shown some, some success, not great success, and there are a lot of people who are starting to use it for proximal stones, so stones higher up in the urinary tract. Again, with only anecdotal success, but it's a fairly well-tolerated medication. The only real significant side effect I've seen is dizziness. Um, most of the time I tell these kids to take it before bedtime, and they do really well. So it's something that we definitely have in our armament that's, that's very useful. Um, in terms of surgery, I just wanted to sort of touch on a few of the, the procedures that we do for stones. Um, we do this if either conservative management fails or if it's not an option. So if they have fever, elevated white count, elevated creatinine, or if they've got a solitary kidney, they typically go right to surgery. Our surgical options, we can either acutely drain them or decompress the kidney. We can do shockwave lithotripsy. Um, ureteroscopy, which is probably the most common thing that we do at Children's and probably the most common thing we do um, across the country. Or we can do percutaneous nephrolithotripsy in, in select cases. So if we have to acutely drain someone, these are the patients that are sick. They can't wait um, until we can formally treat their stone. They're toxic looking, they've got an elevated white count, it looks like they may have pus in their kidney. We can't go up and get the stone, we need to just drain them. Um, we can do that either with a stent from below if we're unable to do that or the patient's too sick, then we'll just put in a percutaneous nephrostomy tube, let them cool down, treat their infection, and then bring them back later for formal treatment of their stones. So you can see here, I just wanted to show you what a stent looked like. A stent has a little pigtail on both ends. Uh, we place it retrograde, so we go cystoscopically into the bladder and then place it up into the kidney. These work great. They're for the most part well tolerated. Sometimes kids will have some pain or, or dysuria or frequency, but most kids do well. And this is just a radiographic image of a nephrostomy tube and an antegrade nephrostogram in a kid with a stone that's a little bit more uh, distal in his ureter, so you can see there's dilation of the, the ureter here. In terms of shockwave lithotripsy, it is the least inv invasive method of treatment of stones. The stones have to be radiopaque. You have to be able to see them on KUB to be able to aim the shockwaves. If it's not visible on KUB, this is not an option. Um, if the stone is in the ureter, it's probably not a good option. Um, and the location of the stone in the kidney depend is, is important as well. If it's in the lower pole, like this stone is shown here, you can break it up, but it's probably not going to pass. You can imagine if it breaks, it's just going to sit there. Um, so we prefer to do them in the mid, upper pole, or pelvis. Um, and it also depends on the type of stone. Some types of stones are really hard. Cysteine stones, for example, do not respond well to this. Other types of stones can be super soft, such as matrix stones. They don't respond well to this. Uh, but most stones are calcium oxalate and they do respond fairly well. Um, complications can include ureteral obstruction from the passage of the small fragments or a renal hematoma. You know, you are basically banging the kidney also with these shock waves, so you can get a hematoma surrounding the kidney. Um, so that's something that we watch out for. Ureteroscopy, like I said, this is probably our most commonly used treatment modality. Um, it is the gold standard. It is considered the gold standard at this point. It's extremely versatile in the types of stones that we can treat and the locations that we can treat. Um, we can treat most patients this way, um, except for patients that have really odd anatomy. Sometimes it, it becomes difficult. Um, but you still have to consider stone size. If it's a huge stone, this might not be your best bet. Um, and again, patient anatomy does play a role. Complications, um, you can damage the ureter doing this. You can damage the kidney doing this. This is not a completely benign procedure. So again, it's one of those things that if we can let the patient pass the stone um, themselves, we will. And going hand in hand with ureteral damage, they can develop strictures, which can actually cause long-term problems uh, for these patients. It's rare, it doesn't happen often, but I have seen patients that have had these, these issues. And they can be devastating. Um, I just wanted to show you some images of what it looks like when we're doing a ureteroscopy. Um, so this is the distal ureter. You can see the ureter here. Um, this is the, the lumen, and we have a safety wire up that we're going alongside. Um, this is a little farther up, um, and we're, we're moving along. And then here we are up in the proximal ureter, 
Here's our stone. This is our safety wire. Um, basically, to treat this stone, we would either uh, grasp it with a basket. This one might be small enough to do that. Or more likely, we would use a holmium laser um, and feed it through the scope and then basically aim sort of in this area and try to break the stone apart into pieces that we could pull out. Percutaneous nephrolithotripsy is the most invasive. Basically, what we're doing is we're going through the back percutaneously into the kidney. We use a large scope. Um, it's about 30 French, so if you guys are familiar with, with French size, that's, that's quite large. That's about as big around as my, as my index finger here, so it's, it's a good size. Obviously, it's got more morbidity because there's increased risk of bleeding, et cetera, uh, but it works the best we're more likely to get them stone free in a single setting with this modality. So there is a bit of a trade-off that you have to consider. Complications, obviously, hemorrhage, damage to surrounding structures. When you're gaining access, you know, the lung is right there, the spleen is right there, the colon is right there. You could very easily put your, put your, um, uh, put your tract right through the colon, right through the, the base of the lung or the peritone, or the, or the, um, or the lung space and, and, and have pretty significant complications. And in the most severe cases, you could lose the kidney. I mean, you could definitely damage the renal hilum doing this. So it's not something to be taken lightly. And this is basically what it looks like. So you can see we're coming in uh, laterally into the kidney and we're gonna break up the larger stone there. Um, so in summary, you know, diagnosis really, him diagnosis really hinges on imaging. You can't always trust your physical exam alone, but the imaging modality that you choose matters. We like to do ultrasounds, no radiation involved, and we can most of the time diagnose the problem. Um, conservative management is safe and effective and is the preferred method of treatment of stones when we can. Um, and there are many factors which, which influence our surgical approach. Thank you very much.